Well, tonight, as I said, it's fantastic to be back with uh, exclusive, with uh, towards belief and looking at this this subject of exclusive faith. And it's interesting that wrapped around the subject of exclusive faith is actually the motivation behind Jesus, the game changer, because there's a lot a lot of people who actually see real dangers in anybody that holds to exclusive belief. And because people kind of are nervous about it, they believe it's dangerous, they're not sure about the idea of anybody that that claims exclusive faith. There's sort of two ways that people go. Some people go to the concept of all religions are equally wrong or they end up with all religions are equally right. And you've probably bumped into both of those people on a really regular basis. That all the people, all the pe- religions are equally wrong is the atheistic worldview, which basically says you can't believe any of them, uh, <coughs> you can't believe the supernatural. If you've seen the supernatural um, episode, you'll see that we discuss the idea of the supernatural and this concept that you can't, you can't believe it. It's not true. Science has proven that that's not true. Here we are in this brave new world of the 21st century and only those kind of lingering with their lives based in a past era could possibly believe in anything that looked like faith or religion. I'm going to show you a clip in a moment, not just yet in a moment, which shows that actually the atheistic worldview doesn't actually work and has been pushed aside by most groups of people. One of the people we interviewed is a guy called Rodney Stark in the new series. Rodney Stark's written 40 different books and a lot of his books are actually looking at the growth of Christianity. He started that not as a religious Christian writer. He started that as a researcher and a sociologist. As I said, he has 40 books, many of them bestsellers. He works at Baylor University in Texas and he's he's a brilliant sociologist and a brilliant researcher. (coughs) His latest book is actually called, one of his two books he released last year in 2015, one of them's called The Triumph of Faith. And in The Triumph of Faith, one of the things that Rodney Stark basically shows, not through thinking it through and hoping it's true, but through research, that the world has never been more religious than it is right now. Right now. There are more Christians in the world than there have ever been before. And in fact, one of the smallest belief structures in the world is an atheistic worldview. If you look across the world, only 5% anywhere, mostly in most nations across the world, only 5% are atheists. And atheists aren't having the massive influence that we think they are. But one of the background questions in Towards Belief, let's go to the next slide, um, uh, friend, who's on the, thank you. Next slide after that. What's his name? Corey. Corey. You're the man, Corey. That's the one we're looking for. So <coughs> what was I talking about? Most, here, here we have the idea that, that atheism is, 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 we kind of think, oh, that everybody's atheistic. And then Richard Dawkins comes to Australia, as he used to, and uh, the ABC could never get enough of him. And, and you would see him all over the ABC, and he would be speaking all over the place. And you get this impression that his book sold thousands of copies. In fact, I think only a million copy, copies that's having this huge influence. And yet we asked a question in our research was, <coughs> how much influence has the new atheist had on your life? And for those who did believe and those who didn't believe, it was between 3 and 5%. Almost no, minimal influence. And so the idea that you get that the world has gone atheistic, that there's nobody out there believes in God, that we're just the kind of small rump on the edges of society is not actually the truth of what's going on. But the other side is if you kind of go, well, I don't believe the atheistic worldview. I think there's something out there that we go the other side, which is that all religions are equally right. And, and, and there's this, you, you would hear that all the time. Everybody's right. It doesn't matter which path you choose. You know, the, all the roads up the mountain get to the top. It doesn't matter which road you choose up the mountain. You still get to the top. And there's this kind of all religions are equally right. Nobody's wrong. Therefore, we can all feel comfortable because we're nervous about exclusive claims. I'm going to come back to that. But Greg Clark runs the Bible Society in Australia. He's one of the guests, as you would have, many of you might have seen him on the series. And here is him, Greg Clark, in this first clip 
talking about the idea that all religions are the same. So what Greg is, is trying to say there is that it is, it is illogical to say that all religions are right. And the problem is it's, it's a kind of aesthetic choice that we make. It's a taste choice, not a truth choice. And often what happens with religion and belief and, and the idea of God is that we make a choice of, out of what we think works for us. What is our taste? What do we want to be true? What would be nice for our lifestyle? What fits into the world in which I live? And because we kind of go, I'd rather choose on my taste rather than choose on what is true. Now, we're going to come back to that word truth in a moment. But one of the things that's occurring is this statement. We want to leave religion out of the public square. And that was the motivation, basically, as we moved into our new series, Jesus the Game Changer. Because in many different places, because people are nervous about exclusive claims and they believe that's going to be a negative influence, they want to leave religion out of the public square. <coughs> Australia today is a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious nation. And in the midst of that, it's pretty hard to keep, it can be hard, sorry, to keep a sense of oneness across the nation, the idea that we're all kind of in this together. And where, how does tolerance work in that nation? And in, so in that place, we often drag out of the public square anybody with exclusive claims because we think that that sounds intolerant. And then what, what do you end up with? You end up with Andrew Denton. I don't know if you follow the news very much. Andrew Denton has uh, been on television, had a number of different shows. The last one was a while ago called Enough Rope. And Andrew Denton was, is now campaigning for euthanasia, the ability to, to end the lives of people that are, uh, that are struggling with some sort of sickness. And, and when he spoke at the National Press Club two weeks ago, Andrew Denton is passionately pitching for this idea in Australia as euthanasia and he said in his talk, basically, and the Catholic Church and Christians have to get out of the discussion. This concept that because you have religious beliefs, you are dangerous for the discussion, because you have exclusive beliefs, you are negative to our community, because you actually believe the Bible is talking into our world, we've got to drag you out of the public square. Now, let me say, as clearly as I can, that is a very arrogant and ignorant statement about the world in which we live. But that reflects a kind of truth that's out there. That if there's going to be, if there's going to be religious belief, then everybody's got to be right. And nobody can, ex can make exclusive claims. The problem is... For even for those of you who kind of lean towards that, because that sounds right, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound right that everybody's right? It kind of goes, that, that seems like the right answer. The problem is we believe in a God and the person of Jesus that made exclusive claims. And while we might, <coughs> in our taste, want it to be that everybody's true, that everybody's right, the question is, what is true? Now, Jesus in Luke chapter 14 makes exclusive claims, and they're really important claims. Uh, you would have heard this. You would have heard this read at many funerals. You would have heard this in, read in many services and um, gatherings and events. And, and it starts off by, with these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. Do you remember those, verse, those verses? I'm going to come back to them. But what's important is to recognise the context in which Jesus said that. Because sometimes it sounds like Jesus was sitting around with his disciples, thought, oh, I should say something profound, came up with it. John goes, wow, that's fantastic. I should write that down. And it ends up in the Bible. And the problem is because it starts at John chapter 14, verse 1, that's when we start reading. The interesting thing is John chapter 14, verse 1 breaks up a conversation. In John chapter 13, verse 1, it is the Last Supper. Remember when Jesus strips down and washes his disciples' feet? Remember that story? That's in John chapter 13. And this passage, this, the Last Supper and the, the words that Jesus said around the Last Supper actually go for a, a number of chapters in the Bible, in John, all the way through to 17. In chapter 13, in the second half, what is Jesus saying to his disciples? 
If you have your Bibles, you might want to find it. If, you have your, if you're on your phones, I'm assuming you're looking at your Bible, not Facebook. <coughs> and in John chapter 13, you look at verse 33, he says, My little children. Now he's talking to his disciples, but he calls him my little children. It's an endearment. It's not a put down. My little children, I will be with you only a little longer. And you'll look for me just as I told the Jews. So where I am now, you cannot come to where I'm going. And then he says a new commandment. But it's almost like Peter misses the bit about a new commandment. He's saying to them, I'm going. Where I go, you can't come. And, I'm, and you can't follow me. And, and then he says a new commandment I give to you to love one another as I have loved you. But Peter misses that because what does Peter ask? Verse 36, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Now, understand the importance. These people, they have walked away from their family. They've walked away from their family business. They've walked away from their economic well-being. They've walked away from everything to put their life in Jesus' hands. They are completely committed. They are right there with Jesus. And (coughs) while we know that Peter lets Jesus down by denying him, right now, with every fibre of his body, he's saying, I'll give up my life for you. What do you mean you're going and I can't go there? Now, in that context, in the context of fear, because that's exactly what Peter's feeling, fearful of the future, fearful of being alone, fearful of not sure where he's going to go. In the midst of that fear, what does Jesus say? You can imagine the fear, palpable fear that Peter and the disciples are following, that are following Jesus. And in the midst of that, worrying about the future, this is what Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust, also, trust, also, trust in God, trust also in me. My Father's house are many rooms. If that weren't so, I would have told you, but I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And when I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where the, in the place where I am. You know the place where I'm going. Does that make more context? Jesus is responding to their fear and their concern. And he's saying, you won't be alone. There's a place that you will go and I'm going to take you there. The really interesting thing is I think Thomas was an early Australian because Thomas asked the most brutal and blatant question. Jesus says, you know the way to the place that I'm going. And Thomas says, and they're all, you can just imagine all the disciples sitting around sage like nodding their heads. Thomas goes, do you reckon we could have a map reference? Could you give us the Google Maps for that? Is it somewhere near the Gold Coast? Because that probably sounds like paradise or or maybe Adelaide perhaps. Um, You know, where where, where are we going? We want to know how you get there because as a matter of interest, Jesus, I actually don't know how to to get to where you're going. That's what Thomas is asking. In these very next next, uh, verse, Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus makes exclusive claims. Now, it might be um, to our taste that Jesus wouldn't make exclusive claims. It might be to our taste that Jesus was one of a whole bunch of different religious beliefs and everybody's right and everybody's happy and we can all have a group hug and feel good about it. But Jesus doesn't leave us in that space. This is not about aspiration This is about information. And when Thomas says, how do we get to that place, that place that we're all desperate to get to, how do we know how to get there? And Jesus is simple and clear. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father but through me. Ravi Zacharias, who's not in any of our series, but a brilliant man, said when Jesus said those words, he made a most reasonable statement. The question is, is it true? It is more reasonable to assume that all the religions of the world are wrong than to assume that all the religions of the world are right. So we've got to look at those claims and ask, is it true? Now, the problem is, 
It sounds arrogant. Doesn't it? Doesn't it sound arrogant? Of course it sounds arrogant. It's like, really? Can you say that? And we end up going, look, when we say that to other people, they think exclusive faith sounds arrogant, like you have the answers and nobody else does. I want you to imagine what it would be like having those discussions in a place like Oxford and the universities around Oxford. So I asked Michelle Tepper that question about arrogance, and here's what she said. It's a fabulous piece of insight, isn't it? To even actually say that everybody's right is to somehow put you, yourself in a position that's even more arrogant than somebody that's claiming exclusive faith and belief. What we're, what we're saying about the person of Jesus is a reasonable statement. Everybody needs to ask the question, is it true? And they also need to ask the question, what is my response to if it's true or if it isn't true? C.S. Lewis, uh, a, brilliant, a brilliant writer himself, an Oxford scholar who became a Christian in his life, a remarkable story. He actually came to Oxford as an atheist and came to a place of belief in the person of Jesus. A remarkable story. He actually even uh, did that one night talking to Tolkien and John Dyson walking around the Addison track just near Magdalen College to about three o'clock in the morning. And God spoke into his life in that discussion with Tolkien. And he came to a place where he believed that, that there was a theist, had theist belief, but he hadn't come to the place of belief in the person of Jesus. And then <coughs> he was thinking about it over a long period of time. And one day he was in a sidecar. His brother was riding the motorcycle. He's in the sidecar for a brilliant man. It's a really interesting reflection. He said, when I left home, they were visiting a zoo. When I left home, I wasn't a Christian. When I got to the zoo, I was. And he, and he came to the place not only of just believing there is a God, but believing that Jesus represented the God that created the world. And he, and he wrote many fabulous books, one of which was called Mere Christianity. And he struggled with belief and he struggled with suffering. And in another book he wrote on, on suffering. But one of the things that, that C.S. Lewis does is he actually is very critical of people who say, well, Jesus was a good moral teacher, a great moral example. And therefore, we should follow the morals that he taught, but don't see him as sort of God because that was, well, you know, that's pushing it a bit too far. And what C.S. Lewis says is that Jesus was either, and you would have heard this before, and I want to bring it to you again tonight, he's either a lunatic or he's a liar or he's Lord. Because Jesus doesn't leave us with any other, any other options. The Bible is clear, and we can trust the Bible. The Bible is clear what Jesus said about himself. And, and so people who say they are God when they're not, well, there are asylums and institutions around this country full of people who think they're Jesus and full of people who think they're the Messiah. There is a, there's a technical word for it. It's mad. And there are people who are actually mad because they've got this kind of Messiah complex. And it's almost like, so, so do we believe that Jesus was a lunatic? Like completely devoid of any sense of reality in his life? Because he is claiming to be God. Well, the second thing was that he wasn't mad. He knew he wasn't the Messiah. He knew he wasn't from God. But he liked to talk about it because that was a good thing to do. Well, there's another word for that and it's fairly clear. It's called liar. When you say that you are something that you are not and you claim you are something that you are not and you know that you're not that thing, what are you doing? You are deceiving and lying. It is very hard to talk about Jesus as a great moral teacher and example if he's a lunatic. It is just as hard to say he's a great moral teacher and, and moral example if he's a liar. And the third option that C.S. Lewis is You've got to actually ask the question, well, is he Lord? Is it true? Is this actually true? Could it be that in the person of Jesus, God came to earth? Could it be that God revealed himself in the person of Jesus? Could it be this is God's way of bringing humanity back into relationship with himself? And what C.S. Lewis, this brilliant mind came to believe was that was the truth. Another uh, wonderful thinker that we actually interviewed is a guy called Erwin McManus. And I want to wrap this up 
by watching Erwin McManus talk about struggling with the idea of which faith is true and what that would mean for him. Thanks. Is that a beautiful statement? That's what we believe, that Jesus came into this world as God reaching out to us. It's not our, our kind of aspiration, hoping that this would be true because it'll fill a hole in my life. It's not actually teaching people that come to Jesus because everything will be fine. It's not actually saying that Jesus is going to make you greater, wiser, healthier than everybody else. It's what it's saying is, put all that aside. What's true? And we stand here, standing with Owen McManus saying, we, we believe this is true. And for some of you, believing this is true and making a choice to follow Jesus won't actually make your life easier. In fact, for some of you, it'll make your life tougher. But you know why you do it? Not because you feel better about it. Not because you're going to walk out of here filled up, feeling wonderful, which I believe will happen eventually. But it actually might be a sense of God calling you to himself. Let me wrap with a story out of our newest series about William Wilberforce. And most of you will know that Wilberforce um, abolished, was the leading as a parliamentarian in London, abolishing the slave trade. And many will know that he was motivated by his Christian faith. Some of you may not know that when, when uh, William Wilberforce went to Parliament, he wasn't a Christian. He was a 21-year-old from Hull and became the member of Hull in London. Uh, he, went through, he went through Cambridge University as a party boy, parted his way all the way through, became very popular, was a smart, bright, outgoing sort of person that people gravitated to, ended up in Parliament, ended up being really popular in London. And here he was, a young man in London, the world at his feet, this glittering career ahead of him. The guy that became the Prime Minister a few years later, William Pitt, who was the son of the then Prime Minister, was his best mate. He was incredibly well positioned. And then he went on holidays to France. And he travelled around France and Europe on, in, on holidays. Now, when you did that in the 18th century, you didn't travel on the Eurostar. You travelled in a horse and cart. And when you're in the back of a horse and cart, you don't check Facebook and Google where you're up to. You talk because there's nothing else happening. And he's talking to a guy called Isaac Milner. And Isaac Milner in Cambridge was spoken about as somebody who was incredibly bright. And so here is Wilberforce and Isaac Milner in the back of this horse and cart discussing things of faith. And Wilberforce comes back to London and he's changed because he believes in the person of Jesus. He believes that it's true. And how do you think he felt? Over the world, excited, wonderful? No, he was completely depressed. You know why? Because he believed he'd wasted his life. He, he believed that he'd just wasted his life, he'd wasted his education, he'd wasted his position. So coming to faith for William Wilberforce wasn't a sense of how wonderful it is, it was actually how terrible I feel. Until it, when he was in, back in London, he could, the only person he could think of to go and see was John Newton. Now you know John Newton wrote the hymn Amazing Grace and the reason that John Newton wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, that he'd come to faith in Jesus after being a captain of a slave ship for many years. He was running part of the slave trade. And in that, he came to faith in this massive storm. He comes back to England a number of years later, became an Anglican priest, an Anglican minister, and was a very popular Anglican minister in London. And William Wilberforce goes to see John Newton. And he says to John Newton, what should I do? I've, I've come to this place of belief. Should I leave Parliament? Should I do something else? Should I become an Anglican priest? And uh, Newton said to Wilberforce, no, quoting the Esther passage, no, I think God has you for this, this time, such a time as this. And William Wilberforce left John Newton's place with a load lifted. And you know what he felt? He'd been given a second chance at life. And he got, he got two great visions for the future, what God had put on his heart. One, one was the abolition of the slave trade. And that's what he was committed to. But you know what the second one was? The reformation of manners. Now, that's not how to use cutlery at the table. It was about morality in England. England was a very immoral place at that time. 
There was uh, the, the poor, there was, there was gin and, and debauchery and drunkenness in the wealthiest and the poorest. There was said of London at that time that for all of the single women in London, 25% were prostitutes and most of them were 16. And in that setting... William Wilberforce says, I want to re help redeem this culture. I want to, I love this phrase, I want to make goodness fashionable. Isn't that a great phrase? Could we not use that now? I want to make goodness fashionable. Was William Wilberforce popular? No, he was not. He wasn't popular at all. I mean, we look back now on Wilberforce and go, what a great saint, what a great kingdom person, what a great thing he did. He was not popular. Bristol, 30% of the economy of Bristol actually rested on the slave trade. What do you think they thought of the abolition of the slave trade? And yet William Wilberforce, in speaking to Isaac Milner, gets to the point where he goes, this is true. And that's where I'm going to stake my life. This is where I stand. This is what I believe. There is my future. And my question as we wrap today is, where do you stand? Not, not about taste. I'm not sitting stay, saying to you today, you should choose Jesus because it's going to make your life easier. I'm not saying that. You should choose Jesus because it's going to solve all your problems. I'm not saying that. You should choose Jesus because you'll feel better about yourself. I'm not saying that. Some of those things may be true, but I'm not saying that. You should choose Jesus because it's true. And if you've come to that point, you need to place your life where you believe. And some of you aren't at that place yet. Some of you are way past that. Praise God. Some of you are way before that. God's going to keep working on you. Some of you are at the place where you go, you know what? I need to make that statement. And if you're a young adult here, if you're going through university, if you're in a workplace that's pushing the idea that exclusivity is dangerous, that you can't believe it, that they're all either wrong or they're all either right and you're feeling completely out of place and you're feeling on kind of shaky ground in what you believe, you, you need to come to Jesus again tonight and say, you know what? I believe this is true. I stake my life there. I place my future there. I place myself in his hands. I ask for his forgiveness to make me right for Jesus so that I know that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me.